Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Resolution Foundation webinar. I'm Torsten Bell, I'm the Chief Executive of the Foundation. Now, this is a, an international um, webinar, but the good news is we're going to be talking about family finances rather than football, which is all anyone's been talking about for the last uh, few days. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the family finances across the three largest countries in Europe by economic size, France, Germany, and the United Kingdom. And we're gonna be doing that for two reasons which overlap. The first is because in general, we don't focus enough on comparisons of different economic outcomes beyond the headline statistics about employment levels and GDP. Uh, and instead we focus in huge detail on exactly what's happening in our each and our individual countries, missing out on lots of richness about what are very different outcomes uh, and that could be available to policymakers uh, to focus on. But for a second reason as well, which is, it's almost staggering during this COVID crisis, how little we know about different outcomes for household finances across countries. Uh, we, we do know differences between on GDP, but even our labour market comparisons aren't telling us very much when we've got large amounts of furloughing and other things happening around the, around the world and Europe in particular. So it's really important to dig underneath that to see what is happening during the pandemic to the family finances in different countries. So that is the job we are trying to do today. And the good news is, is we have a very long report up on the Resolution Foundation website doing exactly that with thanks to JP Morgan for funding that work and to a whole team of authors that have been working on it for what feels like a very long time. Uh, they so that's up to you today. And we're gonna take you through the headlines of that report, but as I say, only the headlines, so please do read the whole thing on the website and you're going to hear first from one of the authors of that report Maya Gustafsson who is an economist at the Resolution uh, Foundation and then we have a great uh, set of respondents to provide some broader perspectives on that so first of all you're going to hear from Marcel Fratzer who is the president of the German Institute for Economic Research in Berlin and has written extensively on economic outcomes in Germany but also in comparative perspective and has done a good job of challenging some of the stereotypes lots of us actually hear, but also in Germany hold about the German economy and outcomes for households. And then you're going to hear from Eva Shermanska, who is the senior research economist at the Luxembourg Institute for Socioeconomic Research, who are one of the organisations that is the exception to what I just said about us not spending enough time looking at comparisons across countries. They have definitely uh, done a lot to make sure that data is comparable across countries and to comment on it. So I'm um, criticising us rather than Eva and her colleagues in that at the beginning. And obviously you can, as always, post questions on Slido. The hashtag is COVID comparisons, and there'll also be some polls up on that uh, website as we go through the course of this morning's event. So to kick us off, Maya, tell us what was in the report. Thanks, Dawson. So I'm going to share my screen uh, to go through some of the main results um, and there's lots more in the report, so do have a look at that if you have the time. So, as Dawson said, we're launching, launching today the major report uh, that we've been writing, uh, supported by Jeff Morgan Chase. It's called Aftershocks, and it's about the financial resilience um, of UK households and households in France and Germany. We've looked first at the position of households um, coming into the crisis, so what the context was before the current pandemic. And then we've looked at what's happened over the course of the pandemic. Um, and we've drawn links between the pre-crisis situation and what's happened over the course of the crisis. And the, um, the, broad, the broad conclusion we've, we've come to on this is that what's happened during the pandemic reflects both the position that households were in before the pandemic, but also the experiences that are, um, have been different over the course of the pandemic in all three countries. We have used, uh, for the pre-crisis analysis, we've used microdata that exists, but for the, um, to understand what's going on in the pandemic, we've looked at um, a major survey that we've conducted in the UK, France and Germany, so that we can actually compare across countries what's happening at the moment. So, First off, I'll talk about, so our approach is to financial resilience is that we're looking at the capacity of households to withstand a financial shock. And that's an important thing to keep in mind because a lot of financial resilience literature looks at financial resilience in different ways. But here we look at the key living standards related factors that determine financial resilience. So we look at the household budget and then uh, look at how that's changed. So first of all, we look at incomes, labor market and welfare as drivers of incomes. Then we look at spending and uh, housing costs is a major portion of that spending. 
And finally, we'll look at the balance sheet savings and debt of households. Um, and what, what we've seen is that financial resilience has been um, felt very different, it has been very different before the crisis, been felt very different across the crisis. So we start off with the pre-crisis analysis. Incomes are a starting point because they are the foundation of the household budget. So if we look at this slide, it shows the median household income by a country um, and income quintile. And we've shown the median household income after we've taken account of how many people live in that household. So it's equivalized. At the median, incomes are very similar across the, uh, the UK, Germany and France. But if we look at the distribution of incomes, actually there are large variations. So in the UK, distribution is very um, the dispersion is very large. So the highest income households in the UK are among the highest incomes in Europe and the lowest income um, quintile in, in the UK um, a lot less. So if we look at the difference between the UK and France, UK households at the bottom of the income distribution and 20% less or have an income that's 20% less than um, the lowest income quintile in France. And the financial resilience uh, vulnerabilities in the UK are not just around incomes, but also across our metrics that we looked at. Um, UK comes out as, um, as a country with the lowest financial resilience across many metrics. So first off, the, there's high spending in the country. So out of the income, UK households spend nearly all of that money. So that means less money is going to savings and um, other, other things. So that's important, especially because the amount of spending that you have to um, keep up in normal times, that, should, that, that determines how much flexibility you have to reallocate spending um, and reallocate um, savings, the savings that you would have spent on savings. Um, so in, in France, for instance, if they only spend 75% of their income, they have more flexibility to do something else with that 25% if a crisis hits. The UK also has low savings. So if we look at the proportion of households with uh, no more than one month's disposable income in savings, for the lowest income households, that was two thirds in the UK and lower in uh, France and Germany. So that means in France and Germany, households tend to have more savings and ha high savings. So the last of these um, vulnerabilities in the UK is that they tend to have higher debt um, they tend to have more debt than uh, uh, France and Germany. So if we look at the, the proportion of households in the UK that have some financial debt, not taking into account uh, mortgage debt, just financial debt, that's two thirds in the UK and only 40% in France and 43% in Germany. On the other hand, uh, looking at housing wealth, this is where there is some positivity in the UK financial resilience. So more people tend to, tend to have housing wealth in the UK and that housing wealth tend to be higher in the UK than in France and Germany. Go, going on over to France, the kind of the main weakness in France in terms of pre-crisis financial resilience was around low and comparatively muted employment rates. So fewer people were in work and that's partly driven by um, smaller proportion of households with um, two earners small proportion of couples with two earners. Um, but yeah, there's, there's been a, an increase, a great increase in Germany and France in employment, but not to the same extent in France. And that means that more, more households who are not in work tend to be vulnerable if a crisis hits. In Germany, the labor market is strong, incomes tend to be high, but there is a, there is a lot of vulnerability among uh, one specific group, and that's the lowest income quintile in the country. So if we look at that income quintile, the lowest one, and um, 37% are in workless households. So that means that 37% of households have no adults that are in work. And this is a lot higher than in France and the UK. So in France, it's 28%, in the UK, it's 25%. After that snapshot of pre-crisis financial resilience challenges, We'll now move on to see how this is borne out in the crisis. And these results are from the survey that we've commissioned. It's the first major cross-country survey that has, shows the financial resilience, the, 
the differences that are borne out in the different countries in the pandemic. So we'll start on labor markets. On this slide, we'll start on the left-hand side. So on the left, we can see that the proportion of respondent households that have moved out of work over the course of the crisis. And as you can see, that's 17% in France, a bit lower in the UK, 12%, and then lowest in Germany, 9%. Out of the people that have moved out, out of the households with someone who's moved out of work, the proportion seeing an, a fall in income is greater in the UK. So that's on the right hand side of this slide. And if we look at the proportion of respondent households with the jobless that have seen a substantial decrease in income, that is also greater in the UK at 41% in the UK, 20% in France, 28% in Germany. So not only are more people, are more people uh, experiencing income shock, but also that income shock tends to be greater in the UK. This, um, these results are driven to a large extent by differences in the generosity of uh, employment insurance and benefits across the three countries. So this chart looks at the household income changes among those who has have recently claimed uh, new employment insurance, unemployment insurance, or benefits. So if we focus on the red bars, that shows the, the proportion uh, who's re who've recently claimed benefits, who have experienced an income fall. And again, we're seeing the same thing that in the UK, if you've recently claimed uh, unemployment benefits or other support, you're more likely to see an income fall than if you're in France and Germany. And not only that, if you have uh, recently claimed unemployment or other benefits, you're more likely to, see, to have seen a, a substantial fall in income. So that's 35% have seen a substantial fall in income of more than 25% compared to 19% in France and 16% in Germany. Usually in crises, an income fall will um, be the main driver of a spending fall, but that's not so much or as much the case in this crisis, because um, the, special, the special case in this crisis is that uh, policy has curbed um, the ability of households to spend. Because we have restrictions on mobility, on social interaction, people are, haven't been able to go out to buy things to the same extent as they had, uh, as they were before the crisis, or for that in any crisis. So there are three main groups in this slide that I want to take you through. So first off, a large portion of the people, the respondent households that have had a decrease in spending, that's the green bars, a large portion of that, uh, of that group would be um, households that haven't seen a fall in incomes, um, but have had a, a cut, they haven't been able to spend on social consumption. We're not so worried about these people. The other group in the green bars, other people that have had a, a fall in income and because of that have had a decrease in spending. Uh, overall, that means that there is probably some flexibility in your household budget to deal with an income fall by reallocating spending. The, most, the group that we're most worried about in this slide is um, the group that had a, a, an increase in spending. So that's the red bars on the right. And the reason we're so worried about this group is that we're seeing that spending has increased more for lower income households. And this is especially so in Germany. We can see again, the vulnerability of the lowest income uh, quintile coming through with uh, that quintile, especially having um, a, a much greater uh, increase, uh, more likely to increase the spending compared to um, the national averages in the survey. If we then zero in on housing costs, which is one of the major portions of spending that people have to, households have to spend on each month. Uh, overall, this shows the proportion of respondent households who've struggled to meet housing costs. So overall, we can see that UK households in the survey are more likely to have uh, struggled to meet their housing costs on a month to month basis over the course of the crisis. So that's 31% compared to 27% in France and 22% in Germany. The second important thing to draw out from this chart is that, again, we're seeing the vulnerability of the bottom income quintile in Germany come out. So 
even though overall households in Germany in the survey report being less likely to struggle to meet housing costs, the bottom income, income quintile is the most likely to have struggled um, to meet housing costs across the countries. There's a 21% percentage point uh, difference in between the lowest income quintile and the uh, average across the country in Germany. And that's compared to just 14% percentage point difference in France and 11 percentage point difference in the UK. So the worst position overall is in the UK, but again, we're seeing this vulnerability among the lowest income in, in Germany. Finally, looking at um, what's happened to balance sheets so and how households are using the balance sheets, the um, proportion of respondents who have had an income shock have had a decrease in income and have then taken on debt to pay for their living expenses is highest in, in the UK at 7%, 17%. And that's um, twice the proportion who've taken on debt to support living expenses in France or in Germany. And the reason we're focusing on debt taken on to pay for living expenses is that that tends to be short-term high cost debt that um, is, is a, a harder to pay off, harder to deal with um, in the short term, potentially for households. So that is a sign of weaker resilience and how um, coming, into this, it, coming into the crisis, UK households had lower savings rates. So they've had to draw on debt. Summing up, we have seen in the report and briefly in this presentation that the pre-crisis vulnerabilities across the three countries were big and uneven across the income distribution. And this is especially so for um, the UK and for Germany. Over the course of the crisis, the vulnerabilities have deepened for, uh, especially for those on, who had low financial resilience uh, to begin with. And they've often seen a higher, a greater impacts during the crisis. In all, in all, in all countries, the, debt, uh, the impact of the crisis will have a lasting impact on balance sheets, especially on savings and debt, for longer than the crisis itself will last for. So now going forward, the task for policymakers has to be to respond to both the immediate impacts of the crisis and support households now without losing sight of the longer term trends and problems that um, play a part, a great part in the situation we find ourselves in now. Great, thank and you very I'll much. Thanks, Thank Thanks very much indeed. Uh, Maya, you've done a great job of uh, squeezing a 130 page report into a 10 minute presentation. Right, now over to you, Marcel. Yeah, thank you, Thorsten, uh, for inviting me and having me. And first of all, a very big compliment to Maya and uh, her co-authors for a really important uh, and, and a great report and a great analysis. And I think um, this is very timely uh, because I think we have seen social polarization, social and economic polarization in most European, most Western countries rise before the pandemic. And the pandemic is speeding up that process of economic and social polarization. So looking ahead in the coming years, I fear this issue of increasing polarization uh, will be one of the most important issues um, politically and also economically. So under, underlining um, what Maya and what the report is describing um, um, in, a, in a way focusing particularly now on the pandemic is a long-term process, a long-term trend that is likely to intensify uh, now with the pandemic and in the years to come. Um, now, my comparative advantage is uh, clearly focusing on Germany. And I think it's uh, maybe also what you described in the beginning to us, it's so important to, um, uh, to benchmark, right? I mean, we have a lot of uh, uh, focus on our own countries and, and what's happening within those borders. Uh, and to understand to what's good and what's working not so well, it's important to have that cross-country comparison to benchmark and also to learn from one another. So this is, uh, I think, why this report is so valuable and so important. Um, I want to make uh, three distinct points um, to add to the discussion and, and clearly more from a German perspective where my knowledge or my expertise lies and, and that of my Institute of the German Institute of Economic Research. Um, and maybe to, to complement a little bit what Maya has been saying and saying um, clearly um, 
uh, one of the strengths uh, that has come out in this report, one of the strengths that Germany has had in this crisis is a strong social welfare state that has provided um, a lot of support uh, to many people. And, and one example is uh, on employment, uh, what uh, Maya described in Germany, we have this furlough scheme, uh, which meant that um, uh, companies can basically ask the government to pay for a big chunk, for the biggest chunk of the salaries of their employees, if need be. And that meant that unemployment has risen only moderately over the last uh, year by about 500,000 uh, people. Uh, unemployment has risen out of an employment of 45 million. So it's a relatively small magnitude, whereas in these furlough schemes, work, uh, work schemes, uh, at the peak in May last year, there were seven and a half million. So seven and a half million people who benefited from that, who could kept, be kept in employment rather than becoming unemployed. Um, yet, I think it's important to look at individual groups. And also in Germany, we have a lot of weaknesses in that social safety net. And I want to mention some of the people that often forget in the discussion uh, that uh, um, employment contracts are important. Uh, so what the people, uh, the, the moral blind spot in that discussion in Germany has been so-called mini jobber, people who work for less than 450 euros a month, who are not entitled to the wage subsidies to this furlough schemes um, that, um, that has been a successful for regularly employed people. Uh, we're talking almost about a million people uh, who are in these short-term work, uh, short work contracts, who have no employment protection, who don't who are not entitled to participate in these furlough schemes, who have become unemployment. These are mostly people with low incomes. Uh, these are not just students, you know, earning 450 euros a month, to, uh, to have a bit more money to live, but they're often people who live in households with very low income. It, it's affecting women particularly strongly, also the, the employment of women, uh, young families, uh, people in systemically relevant jobs, uh, often people paid with uh, having very low wages, and Germany has an unusually large low wage sector. So the first point is, clearly it's hard to drill in to, to look specific groups, but even in a country like Germany, um, where we have a so strong social welfare state, there is a significant group of uh, people who are the most vulnerable, people who have been before the crisis the worst paid, uh, who are suffering uh, the most. Second point, and that I think is an important uh, element about resilience, and uh, Maya described this about wealth and, and savings and the distribution. Um, Germany with the UK has one of the highest wealth inequalities in Europe. The big difference between Fran uh, Germany and, and the UK is that in Germany, we have unusually many people who have basically no net wealth, no net savings. About 40% of German households have no savings. And this is mind boggling, right? Because you would think, uh, you know, Germany is a rich country. The aggregate savings rate is incredibly high and has increased in the crisis. But the distribution aspects are important. We have 40% of people who basically don't save either because they have very low wages, very low income, and also because they 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 rely and, and trust and, and uh, on a strong, so, strong social welfare state, right? So many people say, I don't need to save or don't need to save much because I have unemployment insurance, I have health insurance, I have a guaranteed pension. Um, and um, with the demographic change, the social welfare state in its ability to provide uh, safety uh, is deteriorating. And um, so it's actually very risky to rely on a strong, strong social welfare state that is being able to provide less and less uh, with the demographic change. So uh, I'm, what I wanna say is that the flip side to this strong social welfare state and the high reliance on that and improving resilience for individual households for the most vulnerable is a very important element and the answer cannot be just to simply increase the size of the social welfare state and uh, increase redistribution. Um, third point and final point um, on housing, and this is clearly one of the key social issues of our time, in, in all, including in Germany. Uh, and again, Maya described that very, very nicely. Um, um, maybe formulated in a different way, uh, Germans have a very different way uh, of saving compared to, let's say, British people. We have a very low home ownership rate. Again, has to do with the social welfare state, or rather, um, the, the 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 legal protection of tenants 
which means less than half of all German citizens uh, uh, have a house or have a property. If you go to the big cities where rental prices are increasing and exploding over the last 10 years, like Berlin, the rate is a lot lower. Berlin has home ownership of 15, 1,5%, 85% of people renting. Uh, and actually the ratio of uh, disposable income after housing costs for many people in the lower half of the distribution actually has decreased despite significant wage increases over the last 10 years. So this is a, is a, is a social dynamite and uh, maybe we can go into the discussion later on. Um, there has been a, attempts in Germany to stop the increase in housing prices with little success. Um, but I think this is uh, one of the key challenges. So I think, uh, again, to conclude, um, big compliment. It's, it's a great report. Uh, it's timely. It raises all the right issues. Um, I think it raises a lot of uh, also questions in terms of policy implications. Uh, what can, what should, and what can, what kind of, what can a social, uh, strong social welfare state not do and not provide? I think this is the part of discussion we need and, and learning from one another across country. I think it is an important element. So let me stop here. And uh, again, thanks for having me and uh, congratulations to a great report. Great, Marcel, that's uh, lots of food for thought there. The, not least to remind actually the international, I think people outside Germany often don't uh, see the high wealth inequality. They look just at the income inequality figures and, and the same is actually true in some from other Northern European countries. I'm looking, Myra is coming to us today from Sweden, which despite its egalitarian uh, like branding has very high wealth inequality as well. Anyway, Ava, last but not least, over to you. Oh, thank you for, uh, thank you for having me uh, here. I greatly enjoyed reading the report and congratulations on such a comprehensive report about the well-being and house household financial resilience prior to COVID and then what happened during during COVID. Um, so I'm gonna share, I'm gonna have a few slides to um, contribute here. Great. Yes, we can see your screens. Brilliant. Okay, so as Maya has uh, mentioned, the COVID uh, responses have varied across countries and people have responded uh, differently according to their financial resilience and financial capabilities. Um, and so I'd like to just contribute to broaden the discussion in terms of cross country comparisons and just make a few points based on housing wealth and costs, savings um, and debt. So housing has a very important uh, role to play here because it's the biggest assets in most Western economies, and it plays several roles. It, it not only um, you know a stock of wealth, but it also provides a service to its owners. You can uh, because everyone needs a place to live. You can rent a room to get some more income out of it, but you can also request uh, you know take out a loan based on the collateral of your home. So so it, housing here is quite important. And um, let's see how it looks across countries. So as you've um, in, uh, in the UK here, um, we see that it it's about 60 to 70% over time. It has dropped a little bit in the in more, more recently. Germany, as Marcel mentioned, it's always been below 50% due to the institutional um, setup. And in France, it's quite to be higher. It's um, about 60% right now. But more often we see in Western economies to be of the highest rates to be around 70% in, in Europe, in Finland, Ireland, and then in, in Anglo-Saxon countries like Canada and the US. Right? So, so it, does, it does vary a lot, uh, home ownership rates. Um, here I wanted to point out um, in terms of the home ownership rates with, when we own with and without a mortgage. Uh, and only about half of, of homes are owned without a less than half owned without a more without a mortgage. More, 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 most often we do have housing costs related to this. And across the, the quintiles, income quintiles, we see this to vary vary a lot as well. So in the UK, uh, the bottom quintile about forty percent own their homes, and this is similar in France. But in Germany, only 22% own their homes in the bottom lowest quintile. And at the top, uh, again, there we have these stark differences between the UK and France, where it's about 82% uh, 
81%. And in Germany, it is again uh, lower. And again, here we see that there's a big split between those uh, owning outright and owning with a mortgage. Um, so if we if we look here at the housing cost, um, we see that in, in all countries, the, the lowest uh, uh, quintile pays the most, uh, which is about one third for the UK and Germany and slightly less and slightly uh, less for France. And this declines as we move up the income distribution. And the housing cost is what really matters for housing resilience in case of a drop or income or additional expenditure. So it's, it's quite sensitive. Okay. Um, but here we see uh, this, this was asked through the survey to see what share of households pay over 40% of household income on housing costs. Because the typical, when you request a loan from a bank, they want you to have fit into the limit of 30% of your household income in case you want to get a mortgage and buy a home. And here they're asking for a little bit more, about more than 40%. And we see for those that do own their home, the, the, a very low share uh, reports spending more than 40%. Um, and contrary to those that are renting, and particularly in the UK, we have about one third reporting that they're paying more than 40%. One thing to remember here is that usually owners, homeowners do have higher incomes than those that rent. So there are some incentives for actually owning, owning your home. Um, another thing in terms of spending is to, to look at spending. Um, as Maya mentioned that the UK does have very high spending and it could be a vulnerability. But here, uh, let's look at the split between essentials and non-essentials. And non-essentials are those spendings that could be cut. So here we see that about 53% in the UK in the lowest quintile are spending on um, essentials. And that's similar to France and for Germany, it's slightly higher. And at the top, we have 30% in the, in the highest quintile for the, for the UK here, and then slightly higher for in Germany and in France. But uh, this does indicate that for the UK, for example, we do, there is some room to cut those uh, non-essentials in case the spending needs to be diminished. Okay, this. And then the next, next um, part I wanted to look at is the savings and, and debt. So the more assets and savings uh, the household has and the less debt, the, the higher the household resilience. So we saw that at the bottom of the distribution, there's a lot of spending on the essentials. Um, and then here we'll see that Germany and France do have higher savings than in the UK. So over, over the last two decades, we see consistently that Germany and France have higher saving rates uh, compared to, to the UK. But if we look at, let's say savings, which is the mo most liquid out of financial assets, we see that only about 17% of that is goes to the lowest quintile of the income distribution. In France, it's only 18% and in Germany, 12%. So a lot of it is held by the richest the, the, at the top of the distribution. Um, and here we see, um, this is the share of people that uh, report having insufficient financial assets to cover a three month 25% reduction in household employment income. And we see that about half of those households in the bottom quintile in, in Great Britain report this. And this is slightly less in Germany and France, about one third, which is still a lot less than some other countries in Europe, such as Greece, Italy, and, and Belgium. Okay, what about debt? Uh, here we see that the lowest quintile in Great Britain about for the lowest quintile, about 40% have some type of financial uh, debt. When it comes to Germany, we see that also those in the lowest quintile, about 40% have some type of debt. Only in France, out of these three countries we're discussing today, the, this share is slightly lower, below about 25%. And then when we look at the highest income quintile, then we see that there are 70% uh, of households reporting that they have financial debt. And this is much lower for German households where it's only 30% and thir a little bit more than 30 for, for France. And of course the type of debt does matter because there's good debt and there's bad debt. And while well, credit card debt, which is quite prevalent in Great Britain is considered to be bad debt because it's very expensive debt. 
um, it's not as prevalent in Germany and in France. Um, okay, and then the last type of debt, which is considered actually good type of debt because it helps us pay off our home, is uh, mortgages. And here we see that the bottom, the lowest income quintile um, does spend a substantial part of um, the income in France, about 35% in Great Britain, about 20%, and Germany slightly higher, about 30, 30%. And this does uh, decrease for those um, at the top of the income, dis income distribution in all three countries, although it's still quite high in, in France uh, compared to Great Britain and, and in Germany. So the main vulnerabilities here, it seems that both in Germany, France, and UK, the financial assets are, are pretty nice high levels, uh, but in the UK, the saving rates are quite um, low. In terms of property assets in Germany, the vulnerability is that there is a low home ownership rate and there's a higher, higher proportion of people owning their home in the UK and in France. And in terms of debt, um, um, there are a lot of debt takers in the UK and France um, and for Germany at the bottom of the distribution also. But the thing with debts is that it also means that these uh, households are, will not be as much um, liquidity constrained if, if, there is, if there is a shock. And that's it for, for showing some, adding so a little bit more to the um, discussion on cross-country differences. Great, thank you very much indeed. Um... Ava, now we've got about um, we've got about twenty five minutes for discussion. So I thought maybe we would kick off, and there's obviously a number of chunks here. There's, you know, what do we think about the long term uh, underlying nature of financial resilience for households across countries? There's what happened during COVID, and there's kind of what sh what should or will happen next. So I thought we could maybe take those in turn. So why don't we start off on the past on. And maybe for each of us, because it's good to have a bit of humility on what surprised us from the uh, from the report or stood out from compared to what we're expecting. So I, I will go first on my surprises. One on on the and this this one the first one is embarrassing because it shouldn't have been a surprise, but is um, the 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 impact on low income households relative incomes between the France and the UK is staggeringly big, like a twenty percent gap between. Uh, low earners' incomes in the UK and France, sorry, low income households in the UK and France is, is bigger than I thought it would be. And every time I hear that stat, when the team say it to me, I say that can't be right. Can we check it? And every time they say, you've said that 10 times and it's been checked. So the, um, uh, the, so I think that fact stays with me. And obviously the same is true at the top. You're 20%, you're a 20, 10, 20% higher income if you're a high income household in the UK versus France. So you definitely want to be high income if you're living in the UK uh, and you, you're less worried in France. And then a second one, which is, the German housing costs being higher overall. So there's a whole chunk of the debate in the UK which basically lionises high private renting rates in uh, Germany for the reason Marcel said actually in his, in his remarks, which is they like, we like the security of the tenure in Germany compared to the insecure nature of the private rented sector in the UK. But you know, what, what comes out from this presentation, from my presentation, is quite how high those housing costs are for low-income households in uh, Germany, and that has got to be a big uh, worry. So those are my two. But the um, Marcel, what? Go on, give us your anything that surprised you. Oh, that's a that's a good one. Um, no, I I, I think uh, I, I agree with you on on the the differences in in uh, income at the bottom. I I was really well the magnitude. I was surprised. I mean yeah. that of course yeah. um, in Germany and France we have. Um, fairly strong support systems uh, that is obvious maybe what surprised me was in maya's presentation the difference in employment rates uh, which in france is so low uh, and uh, that is clearly a major problem right i mean you want to get people into jobs as much as possible um, maybe a small caveat for germany is that you have unusually many people working in part-time um, so you need to also account for that i mean it's particularly women half of the women uh, in Germany, um, the uh, labor participation by women is about 70%. So it's it's quite high, or at least compared to other countries, but many, many women working in part-time. And um, so I think, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think to me, um, not surprising, but I think uh, the, the issue of housing 
um, I, I think this is what, what comes out from, for me from the report, which we need to understand a lot better. And Maya, maybe why have I surprised you, but also maybe just, we didn't get a chance to cover in the presentation, but what's underlying the low employment rates in France? Because it's interesting that France has lower worklessness rates in some ways, but still has lower employment. So maybe give us a bit of that as well as your surprise. Sure. So I think um, my su I, I was surprised by a lot, um, but <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think one of the two key surprises I had was in the pandemic uh, analysis, just the high proportion of households in the UK that experienced such a big income fall, just the fact that people are experiencing kind of over 25 percent fall and how that proportion is so much higher in um, the UK than in France and Germany. Um, and thinking about what this means, you know, for future. So what does that mean when the furlough scheme ends? And things like just the context around uh, the benefits uh, system and how big a role that plays. Um, and then on the pre-crisis analysis, I think uh, I wasn't expecting to see such a big difference between the lowest income quintile in Germany and the rest of Germany. So especially looking at the worklessness at rate, just how many people are in households where no adult is in work. I thought that was quite, quite um, surprising um, and something yeah. checked as well several times. <laughs> on, the, on the employment level, um, one of the things that is, will be underlying a lot of this is, like Marcel, Marcel was saying, that um, in fr both France and Germany, a lot of people are working part time. Sorry, in, in um, the UK and Germany, a lot of people are working part time. So it's um, employment rates are higher, but it's the option of working part time. In France, people, people are working part time and there's a lot of um, kind of missing second earners in households. So there's a lot of households um, that are coupled up. So two adults in the household, but only one person is working. So uh, more, more people are relying on one person's income. So in a crisis, obviously, if that person loses their job, that's a bigger hit to um, to resilience than if if you have two earners and one of them loses their job, but you still have some employment income coming in. So that are some of the so those are some of the underlying rates. Um, and also the other thing on part time work in the UK that surprised me was that um, so uh, that so many low income um, households in the UK are working few hours, and I wasn't expecting um, that, that. It wasn't in my slides, so no one else can be surprised about that. Okay. Uh, we'll be surprised when we read it, by it, I promise. I think the, the, front, the French example is, I mean, the, num the, the, the range of couples where only one person is working in France is just staggeringly large. The, um, and that may be for good reasons in some ways, because it means that it's one of the reasons why it's both a cause of and caused by lower housing costs. The, um, so high housing costs is a good push for people to both be in work, but it's also the, that goes the other way around as well, which is if you have two people working as the norm, it does tend to push up housing costs as a percentage of typical household income across countries too. Ava, over to you, last surprise. Yes, what surprised me is actually um, that households spend a lot of money on essential items. And it's not just at the bottom of the income distribution. So apart from the top quintile in the UK where it's less than 30%, in, in, all, in France and in Germany, throughout the distribution, people are spending um, a, a lot. Um, and this could be for two reasons, right? Essentials are expensive on all these countries. Uh, one point, second point, well, at the bottom, maybe the, the incomes are quite, quite low. Um, but um, what this causes is, and since a lot throughout the business distribution, people are spending a lot on essential, this means that a shock um, will not only be disastrous for the low income households, but also throughout the distribution. And what will happen is you'll ha we'll have the hollowing of the middle class where people will start, those in the middle class will start dropping to the bottom of the distribution. Um, and the fact that people have mortgage payments, I mean, these are contributing to also to these uh, essential costs, but uh, I mean, for families, any type of shock will have disastrous consequences because they won't be able to afford their mortgage payments and then they'll have to be forced to sell their house and, and so on. So this, this is something that maybe should also be looked out for. Okay. Um, that all of this is a big part of it is housing costs in all these countries. 
Great. Now we're going to we're going to uh, for those of you that are new to Resolution Foundation oh. webinars, we, we do a lot of guessing of charts. So a a non title chart is hopefully going to appear on our viewers screen shortly. The um, the panel aren't allowed to give the answer away if they know the answer. The um, so this is showing you. Oh, actually, this is quite hard because the colours are not. Uh, if any of you managed to get this without the colours, you're going to be pretty impressive. My, we're going to have to tell people which country is which line. So the bottom line on this chart is. Uh, is God, my which one is it? Uh, I think that's the UK. The bottom line is the UK. The line going up, the top one is France, and the line that was higher and has been coming down is Germany. Okay. Now I'm going to give you a clue. This is about something to do with the labour market. It's about a particular kind of employment and and it, it how prevalent it is in different countries. So if you go onto Slido, hashtag, um, what is it, COVID uh, comparisons, we said, then have a look and see if you can guess what that is. And we'll come back to the answer in a second. But let's, let's now take the discussion to a bit of uh, what's happened during COVID. If we bring up a question uh, that's asking about the comp how comparatively important is the labour market structure and its nature, versus the social security system in determining what has happened and i thought just to be unfair i'd also add an element to that which is like if we think about the big differences because i think going back to the surprises i i definitely was surprised by how big the income shock differences are across the three countries given they've broadly taken the same kind of approach to the crisis on the economic policy side not actually not on the health side always but on the economic policy side so how much do you think how much do we think this is to do with one different approaches to the pandemic so different covid management i.e the uk's had higher economic restrictions until recently two is it about the structure of the labor market within which i mean nature of the contracts plus the industrial mix which is obviously very different in germany in particular versus the uk uh, and how much is it to do with the social security system the um so uh ava do you want to kick us off on that where's your you know so focusing just on what's happened in the last year how, which where are you putting the weight amongst those three things why well, I think it's it's a combination of 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 three. I mean, if if uh, households, if countries are prepared to deal with uh, with uh, unfavorable uh, circumstances for with social benefits, social security, then they were quite easily were able to implement some type of of help um, for labor market structures. If the labor market was flexible enough to accommodate, uh, let's say. For, online working and distant working, then uh, people would not have to leave their jobs. Um, and what was the third one? The, the Social security system, which makes a big difference between them. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the flexibility and the pro how, how well each of these points had been um, um, developed. Also the healthcare system, I think, uh, how, um, how decentralized it is and how quickly it was able to adjust to the changing circumstances. Um, so I think all three, all three aspects would, would have a... Great. Marcel, what do you, what do you think? Where are you on? Where, how Marxist are you on underlying economic determinants versus policy choices versus pandemic control? Over the last year, I would say social security, differences in social security systems uh, are crucial. Uh, if you look over the past 30 years, I would say labor market institutions are the key driver. Uh, and uh, uh, by the way, also for Germany, I mean, as I said, uh, Germany has an unusually large low wage sector, uh, about 21% uh, and below 60% of the median hourly wage. Um, uh, and that partly or largely has to do with the deterioration of, of uh, we call it social partnerships. Uh, so uh, union unionization has decreased dramatically and only half of the contracts today of workers are uh, well, wages are determined through collective bargaining agreements um, and um, so clearly in the long run I think labor market institutions are crucial um, but it clearly if you look at differences across countries now in the pandemic I would say the social differences in social security uh, are crucial that is uh, that's great I mean in some ways, you know, one of the weird things is, you know, if we look at the GDP changes are very different between countries. The UK stands out as being much worse than France and Germany. And actually all of Europe stands out as being worse than America, which is not where, if you go back to thinking about Trump in the White House and the columns everybody was writing in June and July last year, actually the very small fall in GDP in America doesn't quite fit with the story 
that most economists were telling ourselves about control the virus, have a furlough scheme, that's the best route to limited economic um, damage. And that is definitely in the UK, I mean, I'm not saying we've got a perfect answer to why it's so deep, but it is some combination of uh, weaker ability, a worse job of controlling the pandemic has definitely meant longer lasting restrictions. Just waiting too long to start means you need longer and tighter restrictions. Economic structure, which is basically going to what you said earlier, Marcel, about our, we've got a lot of um, social consumption going on the, um, that gets stopped. I think there's probably actually quite a lot in the change in how people work and go to and from work is bigger in the UK. There's the move to home working is bigger. The level of commuting normally is bigger. And so when you stop it, you get bigger economic shocks. So you close down your city centres to a greater degree in London than you do in Paris. And within the UK, London does stand out as being absolutely hammered economically. So, there, so there, I think the economic structure is doing something. But clearly, if you look at Maya's excellent chart showing, even amongst people that lost their jobs, the income shock is just much bigger in the UK. In the end, most of that has got to be the social security system uh, doing the work. But, anyway, but the Americans should tell us why they've why, why it's all gone so relatively well, despite everybody saying it was going to be a catastrophe. If I may jump in, um, uh, I mean, it's relatively well in aggregate, right? But if you look at the distributional effects... Uh, uh, you had an increase in 40 million people unemployed in the US uh, yeah. in, in you know spring last year. So I think the distribution, I mean, groups in the US, uh, are, individual groups are hit a lot harder. So I think, you know, I think one has to say that. That is definitely true. The, um, uh, right. Now let's, let, let's pick up some of the other elements of um, this. So a lot, a lot of what is going on here is households obviously coming out of this crisis. Now, in some ways, some economists say, oh, well, look, this isn't an economic crisis. So when the pan when the disease goes away, the economic effects won't be long lasting. On the other side of things, families balance sheets will have been permanently affected. They're in gen poor, poorer households in particular. But in a bit, like in, insofar as there's one clear inequality that's true across countries, it's low earners losing their jobs more often. And it is poorer households having the worst balance sheet effects because they're borrowing rather than while rich families are basically increasing their savings. So there's one question here from Russell, which basically is saying, like, where does this all kind of, where does this all play out? Should we be expecting, you know, everyone's focused on the state's inc the increase in public debt during this crisis, but how much are we going to see a problem insofar as there's a clear inequality effect coming out of it, which is poor households with just more debt as the back end from that? Marcel, do you want to take that one first? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm happy to. I mean, who's bearing the... Um, um, I think to me, clearly, the uh, banks, financial institutions will take a hit uh, on on a private households become a, a more becoming unable to uh, unable to to uh, service the debt. Um, I think this problem is probably quite limited compared to corporate debt and corporate banks of bankruptcy. So, just in perspective, I don't think this is such will be such a big issue. Um, I think the big uh, issue will be how quickly people after the pandemic will get back into jobs. Um, and uh, um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Should governments help households uh, service their debt, right? Should they, um, uh, and, and there my answer is um, yes, they should help. And I think one of the weaknesses in policy responses during this crisis, including in Germany, uh, that the idea was we need to get money out quickly. So we cut the, the government cut VAT. Uh, it handed out benefits, child benefits. So last uh, October, every German family got 300 euros per child. Uh, and you see, this is can be can be done quickly, but it's not very targeted, right? So the targeting, I think, this is the problem that has not functioned well in the crisis. Maybe that's an unfair criticism because. You always have the trade-off between speed of the policy and the, the way it is targeted. But I clearly think uh, going ahead, governments need to be a lot more targeted. And that, I guess, also applies to, to households that are over-indebted, uh, that need help to, to pay down uh, the debt. Uh, so I think this is an important point, which I think has not been at least in the German discussion, has not been present, how to help government. And, and, and uh, as Maya showed, I mean, this is a substantial number of households that are affected. We are not talking about small numbers. Yeah. Let, let's bring up another question from the audience, which is, since you've mentioned that child benefit payment in Germany, that which is about how much, did because we didn't get into this in the presentation, but how much do children matter 
how does that change? And, and there are big differences across country. Like, you know, to be fair to the UK social security system, the relative role of money for families with children versus income insurance is bigger. As in, so the, state, the welfare state in Britain looks less mean when you look at it from that perspective. But the flip side is the UK hasn't done what the Germans did during this crisis, which is none of the support has been focused on, none of the cash support has been focused on children. And our surveys fairly consistently show that the increases in costs that low-income families have faced have been driven by families with children during this crisis. Maya, do you want to touch on anything from the report on the children's side of it? Um, from, from the report, I think the interesting thing to bring out uh, on, on children is more from the, the pre-crisis um, findings is that uh, having children impacts the ability you have uh, to work. So a lot of households, especially in, um, in, in the UK and Germany, actually have kind of one main earner and then a part-time earner on the side. So, and because we know that part-time earners have been more likely to lose their job, it's also kind of the risk, even if we don't know, we haven't looked at what, what's happened to exactly to parents, um, but if you have a part-time job, you're more likely to have lost your job. And so it, there's, a, there's a pressure on costs rising with schools close, closing us, um, things that we've seen in the UK and on the other side of that is there's if not the job loss there's the risk of job loss and uh, there's the risk of what's going to happen when the furlough scheme sends so there's furlough schemes in all three countries what happens when they send especially in the UK where the support and um, the social support uh, system is quite a lot lower so there's going to be if people go from furlough to unemployment it's going to be a cutoff on yeah. that so big change. That is a really important point about what comes next, which is in the end, the gap between your in-work support via furlough or out-of-work support via the social security system. If that gap is big, it matters more when people start flowing off, which for those of us not spending their time in the UK debate, that's the end of September. So that's what that's our current worry point. Now, I want to bring up the results of the hard to read chart and tell you what it was, which I think is going to, again, hopefully appear, probably still without colours. But anyway, the, um, this is a slightly trite point, but we think it's, this is your guesses. Uh, unemployment rates, blah, blah, blah. Share of employment that is full-time. That's the closest so far, but not right. No, I mean, look, this is... Oh, temporary employment, right? I don't know. We don't know who got that, but that is the right answer. So the chart was showing you very, very different rates. Oh, we've even got colours now. What a treat. Right. So the um, very different rates of temporary employment. And just to be clear what we mean by temporary employment, these are employment contracts that have fixed time periods to them. So it's not all insecure employment. The UK has lots of other insecure employment, zero hours contracts and the like. But, but and what we, the point we want, the reason we wanted to show you this is that the nature of labour market insecurity, not just the levels of it, are very different between countries. So in France, it shows up in temporary contracts. In the UK, it shows up in just generally insecure contracts where the employer can do whatever they want. And in Germany, it shows up via the mini jobs that Marcel was mentioning, where people are outside the social security system. I think understanding those differences and choices is, is underdone in the discussion where we just tend to rank countries by levels of um, insecurity. Now, to finish this off, we're going to bring up a last poll and then I'm going to ask the uh, speakers to give their answers to it as well, which is looking to the future. So you know, what this, this is a long report and it's quite hard to do justice to any of this, but big picture, these are the kind of key takeaways in the different countries. Low employment in France is a problem, especially for second earners. The UK social security safety net is a disaster. And in Germany, high housing costs for poor households definitely scare me looking at them. So here's the question for the panel and then for you all voting on it, which is which of these countries is most likely to have been able to do anything about that problem? over the course of the next five years? Which have which you got most faith in? And this is going to take your political judgment as well as your economic judgment. Uh, or do you believe, or you're a complete nihilist who thinks that none of this is going to improve anywhere, in which case you can vote for none of the above. So Ava, do you want to go first? What's, which one, where's, where's your optimism lying? Oh, you're muted, Ava. It lies, my optimism lies in the second one. So the weak social security system in the UK. Oh, right. That's, that's very encouraging for those of us relying <laughs> on it. Yeah, let's, let's hope you're right. Uh, Marcel, what do you think? Um, my in immediate reaction was none of the above because these are all big <laughs> issues. But then you said we should be optimistic. And um, so um, I'm picking low employment in France okay, because well. 
you know, these are all structural issues. And, um, you know, housing costs, uh, this is an issue of 10, 15 years, right? I mean, it's an issue of supply. Uh, social security safety net, that's really kind of a, such a fundamental issue of, of economic philosophy and, and, and social contract in a way. Uh, low employment in France, um, you know, the, the example of Germany is Germany had a similarly very low employment rate for women in the 90s. And, uh, you know, with the right tax incentives, mm -hmm. you can actually do a lot. So I think that's probably the most feasible. Okay. That's also the one where the chart is already going in the right, well, was until COVID, at least going up. So, the, uh, you know, if something, something was already happening. So fingers crossed that carries on. And Maya, last go to you. Where does your optimism or your depression lie? I'm going to say um, labour market in France as well, because there was some work being done on trying to improve this in France before the crisis. And as you say, it's going in the right direction. So I think that's probably something that's uh, easier to fix. And there might be some kind of political kind of will behind that. The social safety net in the UK, that's been kind of a debate for a long time and it's not really going anywhere so I think that's going to be keep being a debate for a long time um housing costs in, in Germany I'm hard, okay. hard to fix so okay I think the balance of the panel then is luck, lucky the lucky the French and everybody else is a bit structurally stuffed which is a bit depressing for the given that none of us are in France that's not the right answer but anyway the um good luck to those of you watching this from uh France look um I want to say um Thank you to the report authors and to JP Morgan for supporting the work. And particularly thank you to Ava and Marcel for making the time uh, for, to join us from across Europe uh, today. Good luck with your various lockdowns and emerging from lockdowns in, in different countries at different paces. And thank everybody, you, everybody for watching. I hope you have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.